So um, I'm delighted to have with us and to be able to introduce everyone to Rukmini Banerjee. Rukmini is the chief executive author, officer of Pratham Education Foundation. Pratham is an expansive effort that touches on many aspects of education in India, but it's probably best known for innovation and large scale success in, and much policy impact, I might add, in citizen led assessment. And what started as a single preschool in the slums of Mumbai has evolved into a national network reaching 58 million children and youth through literacy and vocational programs in 21 Indian states, establishing Pratham as one of the top non-governmental organizations dedicated to fostering universal literacy. Trained as an economist in India, she completed a BA at St. Stephen's College and attended Delhi School of Economics. She was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University and later earned a PhD in the universe, at the University of Chicago. Rukmini joined Pratham in 1996. She has extensive field experience working directly with rural and urban communities, as well as in designing and implementing large scale partnerships with governments for improving basic reading and arithmetic of children in primary school. She also led Pratham's research and assessment efforts, including, as I mentioned, the well-known citizen-led assessment uh, effort known nationwide as ACER, uh, which stands for Annual Status of Education Report. Uh, and she led that from 20, uh, 2005 to 2014. The ACER approach, which is innovative and I might say daring and groundbreaking at its inception, has now had global impact and has been adopted in at least 14 countries on three continents. I first saw Rukmini speak at a conference held in the examination rooms at Oxford, where she was electrifying, but also very funny as she noted that the last time she had been in those rooms uh, speaking was when she had been taking her own examinations at Oxford. And so it was under slightly more tense personal conditions. Uh, <laughs> more, more recently, I've known her through her work as a member of the intellectual leadership team for the RISE program, uh, Research to Improve Systems of Education, which is a global research endeavor that seeks to understand how education systems in developing countries can overcome the learning crisis. My work for RISE, as some of you know, focuses on the political economy of education reform, and I've been honored to have Rukmini join my effort helping lead a case study of education politics in India. She is originally from Bihar. Uh, she now lives in Delhi and Pune, where she's joining us uh, from today. Most importantly, she loves being a grandmother and telling and writing stories for children. She's kindly joining us at 8 p.m. on a Friday night. So uh, it's, it's dinner and cocktail hour where she is uh, for her lecture titled Before and After COVID, Challenges in Primary Education in India and Globally. She'll talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll have a uh, Q&A. Rukmini, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Alec, and it's fantastic to be here. Uh, I want to tell you that I have no clock anywhere near me. And like all good Indians, I love to talk. So please, Amina or Alec, you know, start waving when you want me to shut down. Um, and, um, you know, it's very embarrassing when people read out your kind of whatever this bio sketches. And for every line you read, I feel like I need to edit it. So I went to the Delhi School of Economics, but I dropped out which somehow is never written in these things. And so for everything you were saying, I was thinking I need to rewrite this in a realistic way about you know, all the things that didn't happen and so on. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, um, you know, um, hopefully there will be some food for thought and um, nothing like a Friday night with a glass of wine for a good conversation. Uh, in Indian languages, that good conversation has many names, but uh, uh, I'm looking forward to, hopefully lots of people will disagree with everything I said and we'll have a really good time. So do stop me, give me a flag for when I should stop. Um, Alec and I went back and forth about what the title should be. And so we've come up with whatever the title is today. Um, and then uh, this morning when I was preparing, I kind of changed my mind a little bit about what I should say, uh, but the title is broad enough that you can almost say anything under this title. It's like a bit like Hinduism. You know, we can all worship our own gods and still be very devout. So 
I'm going to take that line and kind of go further. But, um, and I don't know who's, uh, you know, your 50 people online, I can see four. So um, I, I assume that a lot of them are uh, Penn students and maybe uh, associated people. Uh, but what I'd like to do is to really, uh, you know, uh, there are some ideas that I want to put forth that I feel need some uh, arguments. And so I'm hoping that people will argue about what I'm saying and uh, give me a good fight for, uh, uh, for, 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 for my thoughts. So anyway, so I think that um, just to begin, we are at a very interesting stage in India, as maybe we are in the rest of the world. Um, Alec, you may notice I dropped the globally because I don't know much about globally. So I can only talk about India. And hopefully the experiences that we talk about are, you know, have some relevance elsewhere. So we are, I think, at an interesting point because right in the, just as we came down of the intense lockdown, and we were still quite restricted in terms of what we could do and where we could go, the, in, the government launched the new education policy. And this was, uh, 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 you know, the, this government has been in power for quite a long time. And it, this policy has come kind of in the, you know, almost not in the middle, but early in that second term. Uh, but the fact that the new education policy was released at a time when you really couldn't do anything about education is interesting because it allows us, I think, uh, you know, in most education systems are like a treadmill. You just have to keep going and keep going. And, you know, you have all these great thoughts, but you can't really get off the treadmill. But the lockdown and the COVID the school closures has hopefully allowed us a little bit of a, a punctuation mark. Uh, the, word for punctu the word for comma in many Indian languages, uh, if translated correctly, says a short break. Whereas full stop is really full stop, you know, complete break. So I, I, I think that these last couple of months have allowed a lot of, um, you know, discussion. Uh, maybe not enough thinking, but a lot of discussion. So I wanted to use the combination of both COVID and the launch of a new education policy to kind of just frame, um, you know, what I'm going to say. Okay. So um, the new education policy uh, uh, says many things. And, you know, it's like a, it was a 500 page document and then became like a much thinner document. And it went from 500 pages to being thin really quickly. And I wish I could have done that for myself. I'm still as fat as I was when the 500 page document was out. Uh, so it became slim very quickly. Uh, but in uh, at least in the parts that uh, we were most interested, uh, it, it hadn't fundamentally changed. Uh, maybe in the higher education or secondary education, there have been some, you know, diluting or whatever, but not in the in the core part of where we are interested. And for those of you who um, uh, don't know Sanskrit or Hindi, the word pratha means primary. And so we spent much of our life just being involved with the primary grades and the pre-primary. And so I'm just ignoring the rest of the policy, partly because in the policy document it says that if you don't achieve a certain level of foundational skills by third grade, the rest of the policy is irrelevant. So I'm just taking the license from the policy document itself and really focusing largely on the primary grades. Uh, but you know, at most we can stretch up to the end of the elementary stage in India, which is eighth grade and roughly 14 years. And so the big crux in the policy uh, the big, I mean, the big uh, new thing is this uh, definition of the foundational stage. Uh, in India, like in, I guess, many countries, uh, formal schooling starts in first grade at about age six, formally. Uh, in reality, there are kids who are well under six who come into first grade, but uh, the school education departments are all geared to start from first grade onwards. Uh, unlike in the US, I think where K is part of the school system, you know, you say K to 12, I guess, so K must be part of the school system. But we don't have that here yet. And I think what the uh, new education policy is doing that uh, is saying not just that K is important, but the two years before K are also important. So it's really seeing this chunk of three to eight as an important continuum. It's completely not continuous right now. But I think that the principle behind it is well taken, that if you don't treat this foundational skill as a continuum, then you'll run into a lot of the same things that we see uh, you know, in, in the system right now. 
So here we are, um, and um, uh, I think there has been quite big, partly because nobody could be in the schools and nobody could do much. There's been a lot of talk around some of these things. Um, so I was going to say next, but the next is me. Um, so here we are, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what does this three to eight mean, and you know where are we today, and what do we need to do. But there is a big today right in our face right now. And the big thing in our face is the kids who are going to go into first and second grade are literally going from their, you know, mother's laps into formal school. No first grade. So those who are going to second grade have, have had no first grade. Those who are going to first grade have had no preschool exposure. So you're just sort of just simply launching this. And we've had quite a long history now of the last 10, 15 years some amount of preschool exposure, the idea that preschool is important. Not everybody got it, but we have a nationwide system of uh, early childhood care and kind of development uh, skeleton, which has nutrition and health as the key uh, deliverables, but also does do a little bit of, you know, so the children have some habit of going somewhere before they come to first grade. That's now suddenly gone. So the big challenge instantly that all our governments are facing is how do you cope with this? And I think that again, there is just a knee jerk reaction to any crisis which says, okay, we lost time, but we need to catch up. And so, you know, um, <clears throat> we are saying as loudly as possible that what you do for helping eighth grade kids who've gone from six to eight in one fell swoop may be different from what, for what you have to do for the kids who are coming into second grade. So it's a big challenge. And I mean, um, uh, you are a graduate school of education, perhaps you're privy to discussions about how different countries are dealing with this. This is not just an India problem, it's a global problem. Um, but, but I haven't read too much about how we're gonna deal with this. But having said that, let's just go back to the pre-COVID phase and see where were kids at this age in India. And so this is from our ASAR uh, uh, study. Uh, the last big ASAR was in 2018. We now do it in every other year. So 2020 was going to be the big one, which obviously didn't get done. But uh, a, a lesser known fact about ASAR is that we actually do start with kids who are at age three. Up to age six, we don't ask them to read, but we do figure out where they are enrolled, if at all. And it turns out that you have way more choices. They may not be great choices, but you have way more choices in the younger age groups than you do once you are actually in formal school. So the Anganwadis are the government sort of early childhood care and uh, you know whatever centers. Then you have a government kindergarten, which doesn't really exist in most states. And then you have private schools and there's substantial amount of private school enrollment in many Indian states now with 50% of kids going to private school in states like in Northern states. So private schools, typically even rural, low cost private schools don't like to take kids in first grade. They bring them in earlier. And so this, this is kindergarten and we have a lower kindergarten and an upper kindergarten. And to my own granddaughter, I was teasing her the other day saying she spent five years in school already and she hasn't even hit first grade yet. So, you know, you have this whole long time that you're spending in all these various underground kindergartens and nurseries before you come to first grade among at least the educated urban people. But um, even in rural areas, you have private schools who prefer to bring kids in to something before and then go to first grade later. And then obviously you have the government schools and the private schools and you have a substantial and this number of children who are not going anywhere in, in uh, uh, at age three and four, this is an, you know, obviously the mean for India, it varies quite a lot as you'll see. But just, I want to draw your attention to the year before you get into formal school at age five. And you see that the five-year-olds are like all over the place. They can be in many different locations. Um, before age five, the Anganwadi system is run by the Department of Social Wealth. It's, depart it's called the uh, Integrated Child, uh, uh, whatever, Development, ICDS, Integrated Child Care Development, something, but it's run by the Department of Women and Child Development, not Education. There are advantages and disadvantages of that that I'll talk about, 
but you, you basically have the biggest dispersion of where children go at age five, which in a large part of the world is the age just before first grade where you try to organize kids to come in there. So I just wanted to make, uh, you know, uh, everybody knows about ASAR and about the estimates of basic reading and math, but this part of the ASAR data is actually not used very much. And because of the new education policies, three to eight, all sorts of our old data is now coming back and people are looking at it because we don't have too much data for this age group broken up from the point of view of education in India. I wouldn't be surprised if ASAR is really the only source. So big variations, I've just pulled out four states just to give you a sense. So the states, the two states on the left-hand side, look at them, they have very high enrollment in the government preschool centers. Uh, very little children who are not enrolled somewhere. Now, being involved in being enrolled in the government preschool centers has a lot of advantages because these are centers whose actually primary objective is health and nutrition and immunization. Uh, the other thing is they're usually located in the community. So there is much more of a back and forth between moms and the, you know, you can just drop in. It's right there in your community. The instructor there is very much like your mother or older sister, much closer community contact not necessarily a whole lot of preschool stuff going on, but close to the community. Language is the same language that's used in the community and so on. And potential health and other benefits of you know, creating a good base. Compared to that, you look at UP and Rajasthan, where you can see that low enrollment in Anganwadis. These are typically high private school states. And you can see that even at age three, there is substantial enrollment in these. Um, uh, places and a large number of kids who are so the disparity in preparation for school begins in the right hand side states quite early and therefore as we are moving into this um, you know this period of this new education policy these very large variations across states you know have to be kept in mind because you know we can't have a one size fits all and this is just a demonstration of you know now um, there are implications of all of this. This is a very complicated, this looks, for those of you who know India, <clears throat> and you know what uh, men in the south of India wear, they wear something called a lungi. This looks like a lungi. It's usually striped or checked, and you wrap it around yourself, and that's what this graph looks like. But basically, I was trying to capture a lot of things in this one. So the blue is a uh, percentage of kids who go to private schools in first grade. Huge variation, again, you can see across the country. Uh, the blue and the green describes the private and the government school <coughs> split. And then there is this question of age. What age are you at when you go into first grade? And the gray line, which is everywhere above the blue line, tells you the percentage of kids who are at age five or below when you come into first grade. So our legislation, the right to education says age six is when the compulsory act for free and compulsory education comes into play. And there's an assumption that you're age six when you come into first grade, but you can see that the reality is actually quite different. And so in high private school states, if a parent, and many parents in India are like this, has high aspirations for their children, but not enough resources, then the only place that you can enroll your kids into is first grade in a government school. And so in, uh, I think that that is a pattern that has been kind of perpetuating itself because aspirations for education are rising. And until very recently, even all good economists used years of schooling as a proxy for education. And so you feel that the more years of schooling, the better. So the sooner you get your kids into some kind of a schooling situation, as you're seeing the urban elite do is better. So you have a large, in many states, you have a very large proportion of underage children coming into first grade. And again, we don't tend to look at our education system through these demographic kinds of things. And I as well, it's only because I went to the University of Chicago and was placed in a population research center that I've learned to look at the underlying age and other characteristics that underlie some of these things. So the long and the short of it is, uh, well, I guess I didn't have, uh, the long and the short is that if you compare first grade kids pre-COVID 
in private schools and government schools, you're actually comparing apples and oranges because the private school kids are firstly older. The proportion of kids who are under five is much, much lower than uh, in government schools. And, you know, all the other advantages of being from, um, you know, the correlates of going to private school are also there. Uh, so starting school early, I think is could be a factor. I don't know about other countries, but certainly in India, as, as you universalize more and more, more aspirations go up, poor parents want their children in school earlier and earlier, and you bring them in with a big disadvantage right from the first stage because they're too young to cope with what is already an overambitious curriculum inside the school system. And I had some other slides, which I didn't put in here, which shows you state by state what this is. And also looks at, even if you look at very early, you know, asar like literacy, which is recognition of alphabets and stuff like this, you know, age has a huge advantage in that, uh, you know, in that young age. So, and superimposed on this is the fact that I brought up that a whole chunk of kids are gonna be going into first and second grade without any of this. And as a system, uh, we already, I think, have an overambitious curriculum, even in early grades. This year, you're going to have a whole bunch of kids coming in without any of this prior exposure. And the big question for the Indian education system, private or government, is how ready are you in these early grades to deal with the situation totally differently? So. There is, a, there is a debate obviously going on uh, both in practice and in policy in India, which says that if you were from the early childhood development side, then you would say that you need a breadth of skills. There's no textbooks in the, uh, when you're in a preschool um, uh, center, when you are coming from the child development perspective, you do a whole bunch of activities, you know, fine motor skills, gross motor skills, cognitive stuff is all emphasized. You come into first grade, it becomes literacy and numeracy right away. So by bringing this continuum in, in place, what you really need to do is to do a preschooling of the early years of school rather than a schoolification of the younger years. And I think we are at a very interesting cusp and a lot will be kind of precipitated by what stance school systems take on what they do to the cohorts who are coming in right now. And I have to say, I'm really quite worried about this because, you know, the tendency to formalize things is very high, particularly when parents haven't had much education earlier. I see this as a, a potentially a negative consequence of universalizing elementary education, where more schooling is better for you, is, is kind of the thing that you have in your head, particularly when you haven't had much schooling and you want your children to have a head start. So in the early years, that's kind of where we are at. And it's almost like the destiny of India is going to be sorted out in the next few months. And in the, you know, I haven't been traveling much. Uh, I travel a lot normally, but uh, in the last uh, two weeks, I've met three or four state governments. And I can see that we are vastly underprepared intellectually to think about this. There's also a diff two different ministries handle this early age group. And so those two ministries don't naturally talk to each other. And now with the schools being closed, you know, it's just, it's, I, I mean, I'm surprised that more people are not talking about this early entry and the implications of how we are going to handle all of this. So I want to leave you with this thought and hopefully we'll come back and maybe there are much nicer ways in which other countries are dealing with it uh, that, you know, somebody can, you know, tell me about. So I'm going to skip. There's all sorts of blah, 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 which I'm not going to get into, but um, there is a medium term. How do we create this continuum? What does it need? Of course, there's no money because, you know, the economy is not in good shape, but we have these high ambitions. So to me, that means that you have to look at very carefully at the money that you have and think about how you spend it and not get caught up into kind of centralized templates of how you do it. There are several states who've already put in a pre-primary grade into their school systems. And there are, I think, some lessons to learn from them. But I just want to say that there is this instant problem and then there is a longer term about how you create this continuum across this uh, age group. There are some advantages, however. 
again, which nobody's talking about, and I'm not clear why. Uh, one is that if you went back 10 years, and again, with the USER data, we could do that. I didn't pull out that data uh, in time for this talk, but I should do it. We've had big increases in enrollment in the last 10, 15 years. People look at it as the enrollment of the elementary school age group. But if you look at eighth grade enrollment, and remember that every age group in India is about 25 million. If I look at the eighth grade enrollment in, um, in uh, uh, let's say 10 years ago, or maybe 12 years ago, it was about 11 million in India out of a potential, let's say broadly 25 million. Today, that number is 22 million. So mothers of young children have primary school. And again, in anything that we plan for this age group, that should be a major factor that comes in, that you're not planning even in the very backward educational areas. You're not planning for mothers who are illiterate like you did before. There is a certain amount, may not be a great education, but there is a whole schooling experience. And we need to think about what that schooling experience can do in terms of fueling the growth of the next generation. So that's just another piece I wanted to park there. The other data where we do collect data on the mother's education we have, I did just didn't pull it out uh, fast enough. Okay, moving ahead. Well, how are we doing for time? I mean, or Alex, somebody looking at time? I'm doing okay, okay. So now let's come to this third, fourth, fifth grade. And this is where I would say a lot of Pratham's last 15 years have gone. In normal times, we've been working very hard on how do you accelerate learning at this stage. And I naturally, we feel that after this COVID year, this is a big piece that's even more important. But let's understand how that will be, right? Enrollment has been very high. You know, this is just to show you that even 15 years ago, we were at 90% plus. We've been at 95% plus for the elementary school age group for like a long time now. So this is not that we've universalized anytime recently. This has already been there. But I always, when I show this slide, remember what a kid said to me in a school in UP, uh, must have been in third or fourth grade. And it's a very typical thing in Indian schools to write uh, enrollment and attendance on the blackboard every day. And the word for enrollment in Hindi is a long word. It's called namankan. So I was actually trying to see if kids in third grade knew how to read that word. And of course, there's always one or two kids who can. And so I asked the, the class, can you read what this is? And uh, somebody said uh, the word for enrollment. So I said, what does it mean? And this is the best definition of enrollment ever. The kids said, it means that my name has come to school. <laughs> and I come sometimes also. Okay, so, you know, while these enrollment levels have been very high, there's been a, you know, there's a huge variation like with everything else in terms of attendance. And here's just a quick run through that there are states in which enrollment is roughly equal to attendance. And then there are states where enrollment is completely not equal to attendance. And so I wish I could go to the, I don't know where to go, to the UNESCO Court of Justice and say, maybe I should talk to Dan and he can influence this just drop enrollment because it doesn't mean anything. It just means my name came to school and just focus on attendance. But of course, attendance is highly variable and has many other factors and is measured. You know, uh, we've done some studies where there's one thing that is universally true across India on any day at any time. And that fact is that yesterday's attendance was always better than today's for some reason. Okay, Today is bad because there's a wedding in the village and grandmother passed away and you know my mom forgot her keys and blah 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 but yesterday was a glorious day and yesterday's attendance is always much better so this table that you see is actually today's attendance and it varies significantly so in states where for example my own state which is right in the lowest uh, row you know half the children are in school on any given day whereas there are other states Interestingly, however, this is not highly correlated to learning. And that's another whole other, that's some other talk you'll have to call me back for why that could be the case. So this is for those hapless people who don't know what the ASER tool looks like. This is what it looks like. Uh, it's available in, you know, obviously many languages. Letters, ordinary everyday words, a simple four line 
paragraph which is lovely at a uh, grade one level and then a little story of about i don't know eight ten sentences but it is a story that's what we have and when we do the usher survey uh, the kid can decide what language to be tested in usually we use the language of the medium of instruction of the child and then the right hand side is a math one and i just wanted to give you a glimpse so that we can understand exactly what we mean as we uh, move along 10 years of usher and this is what it looks like for third grade kids yellow is for reading and let's call this grade level for just i mean we are approximating a bit but let's call it grade level nationally in india particularly in years closer to the current time less than 30% are at grade level big variations across the country which i will show you in a minute all the way from half the children being at grade level to only 10% of children being at grade level this is pre covid and in the top states it's not just that half the children are close to grade level but the next 25% is close behind <laughs> whereas when you go lower down it's 10% kids are at grade level and everybody is two or three years behind i mean in third grade you can only be three years behind you can't be more than that behind but so that empty space that you see is also very varied so this is what it looked like and if we want to just analyze this a little bit more in a very simple way here is the children organized by the levels and a typical school system more or less anywhere in the world is organized by rows which are age age leads to grade so you are 8 you are in third grade you are 10 you are in fifth grade but you can see the big variation at least in india by grade and you know everybody and this includes a lot of private schools as well everybody is way behind grade level but as the great land preacher famously said these are the negative consequences of an over ambitious curriculum and this is if i had you know if i was um, told you can only show one table for all of india i think this is the table i would show because this is the current crisis which we are at and this is all pre covid now um again lots of literacy experts on the call if you are you know if you've learned to swim and then you haven't swum for a long time and you're thrown in the deep end you'll probably not sink if you haven't learned to you know if you've not if you learned to ride a bike and hold yourself you know upright but didn't ride a bike for 20 years you probably still can ride a bike and i think dan again you can correct me if i'm wrong that if you reach a certain level of literacy you're probably okay but here are the kids in primary grades pre covid who had reached that stage so the slippage you can almost estimate what the slippage you know could be so what do we do today and uh, here is the argument that i'm using and when i present this a lot of people nod and nobody questions me on it but especially when i present to the government i feel that they look at the numbers they glaze over and they just go back to business as usual because that's like a you know like a, what do you call it that little teddy bear or the comfort blanket that you know how to it's a little bit soiled and it's a little bit smelly but you know how to hang on to it because it's the familiar thing so what the argument that we are using is to say what is it like in a normal year how much learning gain is there in a normal year and i've pulled out the up which is one of our biggest and educationally most backward states and i've just looked at the percentage of children who can read at that highest level which i've put on the right hand side year on year on year the colors are following a cohort across the years okay so obviously as you get older you learn to read a little bit more how you learn it god knows because you don't aren't taught in school but maybe it's just osmosis or infection or something so a cohort goes this way and I, what i've done is i've tried to look at the percentage point increase year on year the lower table is just that it's just the you know each each cell minus each other and so you see for up if you look at my red uh, box that in the early grades as the cohorts are moving down depending on the grade and the year anywhere between a 10 to 5 to 10 percentage point increase year on year in the lower grades and then in the higher grades and in recent years you see anything between a 10 to 15 percentage point improvement just in a normal year when whatever is going on in school happens this we know what we also know which i'm going to show you in the next slide is 
what happens when a government system decides to really focus on foundational learning. The national education policy is saying that by third grade, everybody needs to learn how to read and to do basic arithmetic. But there have been attempts by different state governments to do this before this as well. And where we have been involved, it has used our teaching at the right level approach. So here is UP, oh, I did a very fancy thing clearly. So if you focus significantly, I mean, if you focus really on building uh, skills, put aside your over ambitious curriculum, what were you able to achieve when done in a big system like UP? UP has something with like 120 to 130,000 primary schools, government primary schools. And so reminder, five to 15 percentage points annually in a regular year. Uh, this is a promotion, obviously, for Pratham, but if I wasn't promoting Pratham, then who will? So if you do teaching at the right level, and for a whole variety of reasons, by the time it all gets implemented, it's something like 60 days, an hour for reading and an hour for math a day. And this is the kind of result we got in the 18, 19 year when this was a statewide program. So everything is being implemented by teachers. The basic thing that you get is, the same improvement, the annual improvement that you see in a normal year, you actually were able to do it in 60 or 70 days. This is something, and this is the system's own data. So plus minus a little bit, some of it has been a little bit verified. So take it with a grain of salt. But basically this is saying that you can achieve an annual usual growth in much less than a year if you really focus and put things aside and do this. We've seen this in an RCT done by JPAL on a program we ran in Bihar, similar state next door, where the whole year long, there was some amount of improvement, but teaching at the right level used in a summer camp for one year, produced results that were higher than the gain for the whole year. So where does this, all this leave us? And I have pulled out across the last, you know, pre-COVID two years, wherever a teaching at the right level program has been conducted, not by Pratham, because there we get very high results, uh, very high results as shown by RCTs. But this is by what the government is able to achieve. And almost everywhere you get a much, you get an, you know, you get at least as much as an annual improvement, but done in a much shorter period of time. So if anybody was listening to me in India, maybe they are, maybe one of your 51 people is the education minister of India. Clearly, that's what we need to do right now. And if we go back to what Jishnu Das and Tahir Andrabi and that whole paper from Pakistan is saying, what they're saying is that in the, the, when they looked at the effects of the Pakistan earthquake five years later or whenever they did it, all other indicators, health, livelihoods that come back to pre-earthquake uh, levels, but not learning levels of children. And they attribute the not coming back to not the school closure, but to what systems did when schools opened. <laughs> and what they did when schools opened was to just hurry up and get the grade level curriculum done. So I think that, you know, to me, and obviously I'm very convinced by my own evidence, uh, but I'm hoping somebody here will argue and say I was, I'm completely wrong, in which case I'll stop, what's the word, pro proselytizing for uh, what the data shows us. Uh, I think what we need to do is as soon as schools open, <coughs> do a quick assert like assessment, which has a lot of other benefits because teachers get to connect with children one-on-one, -on -one, group children by level, give it a strong shot we also know from everything that has been studied about India that we don't do a good job when we run school systems as usual, but do a pretty good job when we run campaigns. Uh, and so run, and I'm just using the word 100 because it's a nice number, not because it has any great moral or spiritual significance, but somehow politicians like the number 100 to say as soon as schools open, use 100 days to put your normal over ambitious curriculum aside get to the level of the kids, teach at the level of the kids and bring them up and get them to basic reading and math. You'll meet some SDG goals, but more importantly, you'll meet some national goals, which are saying that you've got to get basic reading and math up and going. And this is the year to do it. 
because this is the year you can blame everything on the demon called COVID and move on. So essentially, this is my story. And here's uh, kind of summarizing where we are at. Uh, in the new education policies, clear goals is that every student should attain foundational literacy and numeracy by grade three. I think that that for the current children going to grade three may take a little time because they've not had exposure. But for the kids who've passed grade three, I think you can do it in this year. If you were able to just move away from business as usual, bite the bullet, you have the cover of this policy, which you didn't have before, and say that to achieve this goal that the policy says, let's just do a catch up, do a hundred year shot, a hundred day shot, and then maybe do another one if you feel there are still some kids who didn't do it. So I think that's what it is. The rest is all blah, 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 but I'm gonna stop. <laughs> yes, long-term duration of TAL shows pretty good durability. Uh, so um, thank you so much, Rukmini. Well, uh, it's so much to think about and talk about. Students have started and others have started asking questions in the chat and we'll uh, go to them in a moment. Um, I wanted to use my uh, chair's prerogative to ask you one very general uh, question. Um, and that is one of the things I've always found so effective in the way you talk is that you, you draw on this really wonderful mix of very strong data and evidence. And you've obviously devoted much of your career to gathering data where there wasn't before on the one hand. And yet on the other hand, the use of storytelling and narrative and, you know, sort of, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the mix of how you need both, you know, and, you know, you could think of it this way of like, what does it take to get those government officials to put down their teddy bear and actually, you know, listen to you? So, you know, I wish I knew the answer to that, but I do think that the closer you are to the ground, the more compelling some of this is because you kind of, you don't have a fantasy about what you're, uh, you know, education system is like or should be like. And again, you know, everything that we are thinking, Land Pritchett has already thought about it. So he has nice terms for it as well. So you're not seduced by what he calls isomorphic mimicry. That, you know, schools across the world all look alike. They have four walls, they have a roof, they have a teacher, children are sitting in rows and columns, there's a textbook, there's a blah, blah, blah. But from even from my data, you can see that in states in India, that whole thing, is actually creating very different outcomes across the board. So when you're close to the kids and close to the ground, you actually know what the real situation is. And therefore, you know, uh, convincing, for example, this teaching at the right level, where you're fundamentally doing something which is completely orthogonal to how the school system is structured. You're moving away from rows and you're operating in columns has not led to any big revolution or big resistance. Because I think for the teachers, it makes sense, but it meets a lot of resistance when you go higher up because there is a view of what your schools are like and what they're supposed to produce. Because at the higher level, nobody's children are in that 50% that didn't learn to read when they were in fifth grade. I mean, any students, if you have students from India here who are sitting and listening to this, fifth grade, they were already on the top of their class. So this is not a problem that affected them. So our school systems were designed for a different population than those who are populating it today. And I think there is a little bit of a inability to see that, you know, if you want, I mean, there's two ways. Karthik Murlidharan says that the Indian education system is a filter. If you just were fine with that, then you wouldn't be agitating like this, right? He doesn't say that, but I'm saying that he says it, that the education system is a filter. But I see the real possibility of a learning for all, at least up to fifth grade. And it's low hanging fruit if only we would, you know, look at the situation in front of us. And I, you know, I say this quite often and now Karthik has started saying it. He just says it a lot faster than I do that I was in a government meeting and somebody in the meeting said to me, why are you so concerned about reality? And, you know, as you can see, I talk a lot. I was silenced for 24 hours. 
because I had no answer to why should you be so concerned about reality? But what else should you be concerned about? You know, so I came out of that meeting and I was with uh, some younger and more uh, mature colleagues. And uh, my one of my colleagues said to me, "Why are you so, why are you so high strung? These guys, they just don't know it. Unko feel nahi hota hai. They can't feel the problem. If you can feel the problem, you want to solve it." But they don't feel the problem because they're very far away. So I don't know what you asked me, Alec, but this is my long answer. <laughs> yeah, that would no, that was great. I couldn't help I couldn't help thinking about um, when I I was very early morning in the age of Zoom. I was watching a presentation by Karthik to the Rise folks, and my wife was in the background going, "My gosh, I'm anxious just listening to that guy. He's so <laughs> fast. He talks so fast." Anyway, anyway so I know what you mean. Um, probably a good transition uh, since you mentioned uh, teaching at the right level. Anchal has a had a couple of had a question specifically about Tarl. Would you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, for the talk. And my I think you might need to talk a little louder. Okay. My question primarily pertains to when we look at Tarl, how have we understood the long-term implications of the methodology? Like when we have there been any studies that have seen where the children who've gone through the process in the long term, like three, four, five years after going through the process, still retain their levels because some of the reading we have done sometimes have conflicting information. So I just wanted your opinion on what is the, is there any learning loss and how does that operate in the long term? So oh, I would say two things. One is that JPAL, so it followed up a one of the RCTs that they had done, not three years later, but two years later. And they saw, uh, you know, uh, considerable durability. The fact that the data was not written up about is because in those areas, we as Pratham had gone on and done a bunch of other things because we hadn't, you know, it's hard enough to keep your control group and your treatment group nice and pure. But once all this work is done, then you want to get on with other things. So. There has been some, uh, you know, tracking by JPAL of this, but we did. We are in the middle of some very interesting uh, uh, exercise right now. In fact, today we finished our own Pratham's kind of internal taking stock. We went back, so we have a lot of data on the villages in which we've worked because you know we do these learning camps and we do measurement, and so we had an end line in the villages where we have about a direct presence, we have data from about five or 6,000 villages from whenever we were there last before COVID. And we went back to a smaller subset of these villages to look at where are those kids who uh, we had the last measurement for. Uh, we, are, we know a little bit about whether they got any inputs that we gave them in the meanwhile or not. And basically what we are seeing, and this is our own internal data. So, you know, we need to do we see that obviously, like you, you would imagine, that kids who had learned to read, there's much less of a slide. But kids who are kind of at a word level, there is a big slide. We also see different patterns of math slide in different areas. And just today, we had a big discussion with our entire team that, I mean, and again, we, we need more data to come up with this. But kids, presumably, who were dealing with um, you know, with their parents, and these are again, primary school kids, you know, with their parents, maybe going to the market and blah, blah, blah. Don't seem to have lost as much in math, but kids who are further away from everyday um, transactions seem to have, I mean, these are just hunches. So, uh, you know, at some level, it's easier to practice math in everyday life than it is to practice reading, particularly when Again, going back to Asar data, less than 20% kids have anything at home to read other than their textbook. And you know, while you may be very religious, you don't really read religious books. Uh, but uh, so I would say that the, what we are trying to do right now is to compare the loss that we see in this COVID time with the usual loss. Again, the data that I showed you from UP, for about 30 or 40,000 schools, we have a baseline, end line, and a baseline after the summer. There's a little bit of a loss, but not all the way down. So I think that, you know, and we, we know this from the US as well, that there is a summer loss and then there is a gain, but we don't have enough data for such things from other parts of the world. And so I think that we fall back to the other data because that's something that you have at least year on year for many years. You know? There was so a- Come to India and do this study is my answer. Yeah, so along the- um, 
keeping with the Tarl, we'll have one more question on Tarl. Saiti had a question. If you wanna, as a follow-up, uh, if you wanted to unmute yourself. Uh, so basically it was related to the budget cut that happened for education in India recently. So I'm just wondering how, uh, do you think there's gonna be a shift of focus from the pre-primary education that the NEP talks about because of this budget cut? Is there gonna be any strain? Like, I think there has been a focus on ECC for a really long time in the policy, but with this budget cut, do you think this focus is still going to be shifted towards higher education than being on uh, the early childhood education? So I would say that the budget focus on early childhood has really not been there. There has been money for early childhood, you know, for ICDS, but the ICDS workers are quite poorly paid, you know, highly worked and so on and so forth. And I, I, I don't know enough about budgets to know how their budgets have moved because, you know, now as far as school education goes as well, if it's, you know, what is allocated and what is spent and when does the money flow? I mean, there's a whole teams of people who are just studying that. That money flows towards the end of the school year when you can't really use that money for. So one of the reasons that even our government partnerships for teaching at the right level start happening in November or December is because of the fund flow issue. Because by the time, you know, the money actually comes and you print your materials, it's already in November. And then you have the whole school year that's about to finish. And then there's going to be a whole big lag, right? So I really think that, you know, I don't want to say that more money is not useful because I think for everyone at any stage, more money is always a good thing. But I think a more, uh, effective use of the existing funds moving better, what I think you would see a bit, because the system is also used to money not coming in time. So, you know, we are right now in, you know, whatever, almost March. Let's say schools are beginning to open. There's a new school year in April, but nobody has their hands on their money and they're probably going to get it. But this is the year in which you should have put aside all these, you know, ways in which you move money and said that, you know, to recover, here's what you, I mean, here's your own money, not increase, not nothing, but let's give it to you early, which hasn't happened. So I think the money is a very interesting question and not enough is done. So I, for example, I was talking to Yamini, who, um, you know, uh, is in the Center for Policy Research, and they have a initiative called PESA. And the word acronym stands for various things, but basically it stands for money use uh, at the school level. Because we see in the states where we work that while the policy of how the pre-primary stuff, the ICDS and the school education works, and there's no convergence, but there are plenty of schools or the Anganwadis which are located in the schools that have worked out a good system amongst themselves. But there's no budgetary analysis of this to say, what do they share? How much is spent in a school? And if you leave schools to their own devices and say, guys, go ahead and collaborate, would they do a better job than when we tell ministries to collaborate? So, you know, I, I, I think money is behind a lot of this, but a better use of existing money would take us quickly to a better place than saying, you know, I need my 6% of my GDP. That's not going to happen. I mean, they're... You know. Brandon had a very interesting question about digital innovation and problems use of it. Brandon, you want to unmute yourself? Um, hi, Dr. Banerjee. Um, I just had a question about um, some of the digital innovations that Proctum has done uh, during COVID uh, to be able to reach some of these students who are out of the classrooms. And um, I wonder if you have any um, insights as to like how that's been able to close some of these, um, uh, at, to address some of these learning gaps that students aren't able to have during these school closures and what you foresee this being. Um, how this could be incorporated through institutional partnership support um, uh, whenever schools start to reintegrate to kind of address some of these long-term issues of school readiness, inconsistent attendance, and also out of school children in general. And then I had a second question to that, particularly around um, minoritized languages and these non-dominant ITM languages and learning and how this could potentially address some of those uh, long-standing issues within the educational system, but also possibly disambiguate some of the points of the new education policy around language. 
the danger of two questions is that I forget the first question. So let me answer the first question first, okay? Um, so I think that, uh, um, and I hope there is some, you know, I hope Kathy Hall will come and study what people were thinking when the lockdown happened and did they act rationally and all this kind of stuff, because I think it's very interesting how you kind of reacted organically. So our first reaction was not to worry about learning, which is a kind of strange thing to say, considering we've spent our entire life just trying to improve reading and math. But I think the first reaction of the entire Pratham team, which was six, 7,000 people was just to make sure that everybody's okay. So we, I think we spent the, really the lockdown just kind of staying in touch because it was not that easy to be in touch. And just like you did with your elderly aunt or your nephew who was alone, we did exactly that. We just called and are you okay? And how are you doing? And blah, blah, blah. We didn't have phone numbers because we are used to working face to face. So then this whole finding, this whole network of phone numbers was also very interesting because we then, you know, after the first couple of weeks, we tried to systematize what we were doing. We said, supposing you are in, you know, whatever, six, 7,000 villages, do we have at least one number for every village? We call the number. The advantage we had was in the villages where we worked, we knew the layout, we knew the geography of it. Also, you remember that we had to, you know, the uh, lockdown happened very quickly after Holi, which is a major holiday. And a lot of people had gone home for Holi, leaving their little diaries where you have everybody's numbers back in the place where you lived. Because you were gonna come back in a couple of days and you never came back for a year. So just establishing, we, I mean, you know, you had never thought you'd have to work from remote. So, you know, you first got a contact into the village, then you got a contact into the hamlet, then you, from the hamlet, you got into every family, blah, blah, blah. So I think we spent quite a bit of time just establishing the staying in touch network. And then we realized quite quickly that while all this fancy stuff about sending videos and whatnot, I mean, online classes, nobody even considered because that's not possible. But we did use smartphone and sending WhatsApp messages. But then you could see that, you know, here I am talking to so and so. I'm talking to Alec, but you know, his I know that he has a basic phone, and that his dad dad is at home today because there's a lockdown. But as soon as the lockdown is lifted, dad is going to go off to work somewhere, and the phone will go with him. So we used a lot of SMS, and I think the use of SMS was also very interesting because you know SMS has a character limit, right? Hundred and it varies a little bit by language, but uh, let's say 160 characters. So what can you pack into 160 characters that actually could mean more than just, hi, how are you, what's going on? And we've, we've done some work on that about how, so I'll give you an example. Uh, and you know, I should, have, I should have the text here, which I don't. So take a thread, which is 30 centimeters, make shapes with it. Uh, measure each side, write the name of the shape and tell someone. I think you can fit almost all of this into 160 characters. And then we would say that when this message goes home, what happens? Who gets it on whose phone and who helps whom? And then you would see how do kids move along this? So this is not education. This is just a slightly sophisticated staying in touch. But we learned a lot. And I think that all, and this was not sent as a bulk SMS. Because we also had to operate, you know, the entire funding of Pratham was also in question at the time. Because this, the lockdown happened when school, <coughs> our financial year and the school year is the same in India. So a lot of our grants get renewed in the April, May, June time, which is exactly when, you know, the whole world was in a lockdown. And so we weren't sure. So we weren't spending any money. And so you had to be below your uh, cell phone provider's daily limit which is apparently a hundred SMSs a day. And so, you know, you were kind of, but we decided not to go on bulk SMS because it wasn't just the SMS or the WhatsApp that mattered. It was the phone call that you made to the family. So daily message followed by a weekly phone call of how are you, what's going on? Dan, did you like the message I sent on Tuesday or was the Thursday one better? Why did you like this one? Why did you like that one? And this two-way communication taught us a lot. And I think that layer that we will add on to what we are doing today is teaching at the right level, we knew how to do, but reaching at the right level, we've learned that parents tend to get involved when the message that comes is less textbook-like. So if you send a message saying, how, much, how many buckets of water did you use yesterday? How much for washing and how much for cleaning? 
entire family gets involved. You get phone calls saying, yesterday the water situation is really bad. Can I tell you tomorrow? Why bucket? Why not something else? You know, all these discussions happen because this was a message which clearly involved the family. If I said, what is an isosceles triangle? Everybody said to kids, go figure it out. This is some textbook stuff. So I think this reaching at the right. So I'm saying that although your question, Brandon, was on technology, I think what we learned is what the, the human angle behind the uh, remote, I think was very valuable. And so one of the things, every three months we've been asking families, we send out 300,000 messages a day, even today. But we take stock at a certain point every couple of months to say, is this really boring? Are you fed up of this? Do you think I'm just a you know, marketing person or do you want this again? And three times during this year, parents have come back saying, keep it. But by the way, you can do this and you can do that and why not and blah, blah, blah. So a whole layer of what can parents do if they are approached in the right way in this SMS mode has been one big learning. The other one is there have been some governments who've been combining this whole SMS campaign with something more like a radio or a TV and doing kind of multiple. So my you know, long answer, Brandon, to your question is, I think that on the low tech front, a lot of things have been tried. There's a lot of focus on the high tech stuff and on apps and on whatever, online learning and whatnot. But we've benefited a lot from the low tech stuff in being able to understand parents and their interaction better. And we intend to keep at it because I think there are things we've been able to do which are not costly and why did we not do it before? So that's one. And the other one is that, as I was saying earlier, that we have just taken stock and we can clearly see that even in the way that we've kind of collected the data over the last 10 days, that families who used whatever inputs were available, textbook, SMS, means that the family was motivated to do something more for the kids or to maximize whatever was possible. Kids are doing better than families who didn't have, I, I mean, I don't know what are the correlates of motivation or that, you know, uh, extra effort. I mean, anybody who moved out of their comfort zone and said, forget the teddy bear, let's go out looking for, seems to have done better. So, I don't know if I answered your question, Brandon. And your whatever your second question was, I've completely forgotten. It's fine. Thank you so much. So we have a question from our own Dr. AGK on socio-emotional learning. Yes. Uh, next. Well, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm curious about where SEL falls into all of this. I know that Pratham you know, prioritizes this, thinks it's important, but a lot of what you've been talking about is about reading and, and writing. Um, and I'm just, especially given the fact that we are in this, you know, in, in a pandemic where obviously we want to be sort of be, like you're saying, you know, the first things you did was you connected with people. What are we doing to make sure that that aspect of children's learning is being taken care of? Because a lot of people argue that social emotional learning needs to be taken care of first before we can actually get to the reading, the, the cognitive, um, harder cognitive skills. So, so I think, um, I think Amina, we approached it without calling it social emotional learning, partly because maybe we are not well versed in the theoretical literature. The first thing was that there's so much tension around and so much uncertainty. Can we send a little activity every day that everybody can take their minds off, you know, all the horrible things that they have to think about and just do it. And so, and you can see that if you go on our website, we were able to capture some of the, because people would send us pictures, they would send us videos. The idea was, can I, I mean, in principle, we wanted families to be engaged with learning for all the reasons that why families should be engaged with learning. But I think that, I think for the, for the uh, first time in our measurement, we really paid attention to the process as opposed to the outcome. We didn't measure the socioeconomic part, but I think in our face is who was motivated to do more, who helped their kids, you know, why did they do that? If you look at the ASER report for 2020, which was a phone survey, and it was not focused on outcomes. It was focused on who is doing what in the family. You see a massive parents trying to help with whatever they can. Social emotional learning tends to be centered on children. I think it has to be a family thing. There are clearly families that are getting together better than others. 
There are families which may be under bigger stress. And I feel in this stuff, I don't know what the measures would be, but you can feel it. You can see it. You can see it when you call parents and they know everything that the kids are doing. And then you call parents who say, which kid are you talking about? And you know that's just the tip of the iceberg for what else must be going on. So to me, I think that while we didn't call it explicit, explicitly call it social emotional learning, this whole year has been a lot also about the stress that our own people have been going through because they come from very similar families. And you know, while I mean we cared about them before, but this you know you you can't do work from home when you have just one room and it's designed that everybody's out most of the time. And so if I'm having, you know, this conversation, then blah, blah, blah. So I think there's been a whole uh, thing about well-being of our own people, well-being of the kids, well-being of the moms who, you know, uh, and we've done some things very organically. But I would say we, other than saying that I need the human touch, I don't think we've done any measurement of what would typically be called SEL, but you can feel it everywhere. Day, you had a very interesting question on potential pushback from parents uh, to uh, some of the strategies post COVID. Yes, I did. Thank you very much, Dr. Banerjee. It's good to see you again. So, uh, my I'll just read my question now, basically. I said, I'm having worked in administration in a school as the pandemic started and shortly after. Um, I can relate to a very large degree about the ambitious curriculum that most schools run. And this is I'm from Nigeria. Um, so we had to go back to the drawing board and decide, we needed to pause, decide how do we want to approach our resumption. And it was interesting to note that the bulk of the pushback we received from the plans came from the parents who want to see their children have, they can't just be learning reading and writing or math and reading. We need them to do this, we need them to do this. So um, do you anticipate pushback from parents? Should the government of India implement your post-COVID ideas? And if yes, how do you intend, how can we mitigate against this? I think there needs to be a marketing campaign for, for what is good for kids, right? And I think the pushback, you're absolutely right. The bigger pushback comes from the parents who haven't had that exposure themselves where they're very worried that the gains that have been made on enrollment are going to be rolled back and that the urban elite kids are gonna be just fine because they all know and they have all these resources, but you know, here is my daughter and she made it up to eighth grade. And now you're gonna say that there's gonna be no 10th grade exam and how the hell can you do that and blah, blah, blah. So I think that, you know, we spend a lot of effort in marketing certain things. You know, that marketing effort needs to come into Somehow, I mean, education, we are, we are uh, you know, uh, dominated by pedagogy and metrics and assessment and none of this, you know, why are we doing this and where is it going? So I feel that for this to succeed, you have to really have very high level political understanding that, you know, again, I'm quoting Lant, who said this to say, you need to go slow sometimes to be able to speed up later. And that going fast right now is gonna put your kids back forever. And, you know, I, I mean, I, like you're absolutely right. When I say some of the things that I'm saying to you today, but say it in a way that say a rural parent can understand, they get really nervous, they get really worried. And I've had people say to me, but your kids, they went through a, you know, regular school system, right? And so you're telling us for our kids, we need to slow down, but you didn't slow down for your kids. You know, that kind of thing. So I think that there has to be political talk around this. There has to be talk of this in the bigger atmosphere. It's not just a school. I mean, we can't abandon the school system to deal with this alone. If they have to have more, firstly, they have to have the internal courage, but they also need to have, you know, the external support to be saying that this has been such an unusual time that you need to do things differently. I think there is also, a, I don't know about Nigeria, but I think in India, there's a fundamental distrust that actually the education system is a filter. And I don't wanna be cheated in that filter. So how do you convince people in a truly honest way to say, no, I care about your children's learning. I'm gonna be with you. I'm gonna try whatever it takes because that hasn't happened before. So it's in a way, this is the time when 
you know, is this really learning for all or is it bullshit? <laughs> it's right in our face, you know. And you see politically very few people wanting to bite because it's a very dangerous deal. You haven't, you've increased schooling and you know how to do that, but increasing learning, you know, you, know, you want to be the chief minister for a long time. You, you'd rather say, I'm gonna give scholarships because that, you know, you know how to do that and, you know, get away with it. So. Well, as a follow-up to the, you know, needing to go slow so you can go fast and the sort of the short term and the long term. Uh, Dr. Wagner had a question uh, in that vein. Yeah, hi, Rukmini. Um, let me just say at the outset, I love your work and I've been following it for a long, long time, as you know. And uh, I but there's think- there's a but coming. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm smarter than that. <laughs> But no, I, it just so um, it, it's not only engaging, it's so important the work that you're doing. You really, and I think your last comment, if I could say, you know, trying to uh, speak truth to power uh, using, I mean, this is what we try to do, I think, in IDP anyway, is uh, challenge the things that we hear uh, from different kinds of stakeholders and try to hold people's feet to the fire. I, my question um, is, uh, and I've been I've um, been thinking about this ever since sort of Tarl appeared. I wanted to say I was in my in my reflections on it. I was realizing that Tarl, of course, is our newest acronym for something that we've done ever since anybody taught anybody anything, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And all all the great religions use teaching at the right level to tutor people and mentor students forever and ever before the word school even appeared. Uh, so I think it is so convincing on the logical grounds. My question is um, around the kind of feedback I'm guessing you get from some people uh, who uh, are perhaps in government or maybe others in academia uh, as well. So I see, I'm completely convinced that you're right in terms of Tarl in the short term, uh, certainly during COVID, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, what has concerned me is the longer term piece of Tarl, because one reason why we got rid of uh, when we started to industrialize schooling and led to universalized schooling, and we got away from Tarl is because we couldn't afford it. Uh, to some extent, we teachers couldn't teach every child at the right level, or at least that was the view. And and uh, so on and so forth. It's a long story, but I guess as we as we start looking at the uh, whether Tarl could be something that could be um, incorporated into enormous school systems like India, I guess my question is, um, what? How do you, when people raise the objection, as I'm sure that they have, you know, how are we really going to do this? We have a curriculum. Sure, it's ambitious, but if we only hold some schools to a lower standard because you want to do Tarl and other kids, maybe in private schools, they don't have Tarl because mm -hmm. they're doing fine, as you said before. Um, the, this, uh, this seems to me the kind of challenge that we'll, you'll be running into downstream a bit. And I'm just wondering if you've, how you respond oh. to that. So I think, I think you're absolutely right, Dan. It's a good idea to analyze the different kinds of objections you get from different sorts yeah. of people, right? So one objection, which is, uh, you know, which comes up is what about those 20% which who are at the right level? I don't want to hold them back. And, you know, so when we do the, you know, if I, if I go back to my grid, we say the whole school, earlier we used to do pull out when the early RCTs were done, you did a pull out of the kids who needed the help. But we've sub subsequently moved to saying, everybody's in some level and everybody's got something to do. And it, the kids just, you know, empty out the lower levels really quickly when it's very successful. And then everybody's at the top level. So one of the, one of the objections about, are you ignoring those who are at level is taken care of like that. The other is, which comes a lot from theoretical people who've been in highly streamed systems, is that this is not leveling, it is labeling. And again, a bad use of TAL can lead to that. 
So I had, for example, uh, one of the state governments is currently being uh, advised by a consulting company. And uh, the consulting company head said to me, oh, we do it all. So I said, describe to me what you do. Assessment. Oh, no, no, no. Your kind of assessment is too cumbersome because it's child on child. Well, you have to do child on child and it's not cumbersome. We do three quarters of a million children in like two months. It's, you actually can have fun doing it. So then that was the one. Second thing she said is, oh, children don't move that fast. Well, actually, in the prime tal, when Pratham people do it, kids move every 10 days. There's nobody left in the lower group in like two weeks time because everybody's moved ahead. So it's not labeling. You only label when it's very static. But it's such a dynamic situation if you do it right, that kids move very quickly and soon there's nobody left in the lower level. But those who come with this labeling versus leveling haven't experienced a very dynamic situation where things change all the time, right? But I think the more fundamental question, Dan, is there is a foundational scale and then there is grade level. There's a big gap between those two. Exactly. Now, one is lowering that, why the hell is that curriculum where it is? I mean, why do you need to learn algebra when you're 11? I mean, is that really necessary? These are big questions that these are, you know, you'll have to go to the parliament to solve them, which is like a long journey. So, so one, the question about why is the curriculum over ambitious and what, how to make it less ambitious is a big one. But I think on a more practical level, we have been so busy doing the foundational level that we haven't worked out what's the glue between the foundational level and the, and the you know, whatever the grade level is. And we've also, I think, taken a slight detour in saying that, you know, by the time you do all this, you're in fifth grade. But really, the, and we're not raising too many questions about why primary schools need to do what they do. But I think there's a big question waiting to be answered is, what is this whole middle school for? Why the hell are we spending time doing what we are doing in middle school when kids are not learning any of the everyday skills? And we've been tackling that as Pratham in a lot of out of school community based work. Mm -hmm. And because it's, you know, it's such a pain to come into the school and fight this fight also. So to me, the long run, and I may not live to see this, is if you were to do this foundational stage from the three to eight well, then these problems should just reduce just by the fact that you're bringing in a much more solid cohort as you go through. And if you do that with very articulate parents, with, uh, with uh, I'm not saying your name right, I'm sure, with Adeya's point of view, which is that how do you bring parents along? I think it's easier to bring them along at a young age, when A, they can participate in the development of the kids, B, the kids love to be with their parents at that age. They don't, after they're eight or nine, they want their own independence. So if you build a team of child and mom solidly along with the teacher to do that early grades, then I think you could, you could just phase out the problem that we've been grappling for 15 years. But well, that's kind of, some, kind of an ideal scenario. <laughs> so I, you know, in the age of Zoom, I have my kids in the background. I'm gonna have to ask you to be quiet on the, why do we have to learn algebra stuff? You know, <laughs> <laughs> that could cause me trouble later. Uh, but um, no, Somia had a question switching gears a little bit to another part of Brotham's work on the Learning Excellence Program. Somia, if you could unmute yourself. And I think we'll probably have time for one more question after that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, for speaking with us today. And um, I also really, really uh, follow Brotham's work and I really appreciate it. I wanted to ask about, um, again, in the vein of working with parents, that your learning excellence program, um, where you uh, bring in teachers and parents and you train them, and then you go back into the communities. How do you think this program can be used or how do you foresee it being used um, post COVID to prepare children for school and to increase their um, grade level understanding? I think that, you know, this whole, as I was saying, this uh, COVID period has been taught us not so much about instructional practice or maybe teaching, but more about these who is out there and what can they do and how do we bring in the best out of them. So in our early grades work, a key piece is that we have two pieces. One is a community volunteer who helps in the uh, government preschool programs. She does one song, one story, one game a day. 
one hour, 45 minutes, come in and have fun with the kids. And the second one is we form neighborhood groups of mothers because we feel that even in crowded countries like India, young mothers are very isolated. They do a lot of work. They don't have much leisure and therefore bringing them out of their homes into some kind of a legitimate group. So I would say that these are pieces of one is a young person in the community who is a friend to the mom and friend to the kids. The other is groups of mothers. We've had some very interesting uh, learnings from like women's self-help groups. It's a bit of cheating because that social structure of the women's self-help group exists. So how do you insert this little agenda into it so that you can leverage the power of the, you know, the other group dynamics? Uh, but I think Somya, as a, you know, as a short answer, I think there's a lot to be done on really reaching at the right level. Because I think we are, we have a lot of resources out there that we are ignoring because we are obsessed in our education system with pedagogy and curriculum and the usual stuff that goes into a school system and not looking at the resources we have. Um, in my own home state, Bihar has a massive um, self-help group, uh, a, a very strongly supported self-help group uh, network. Sometimes people say that the chief minister is willing elections because of the his woman-oriented uh, agenda and this vast network. And there we have figured out that in 10 meetings of a self-help group, strong structure, how you can get the women to know the learning levels of their children, how you can organize them to go to school and say politely, by the way, why is my kid not moving up? What are you going to do and what shall I do? How can you get women to do some things? They are illiterate, but they can do oral stuff at home. And 10 meetings is not a long time to get some of this going, but it has the power of a already existing group. So, you know, what are groups out there? In the COVID period, uh, you know, we had never thought about reaching out to non-education organizations for partnerships. We had a massive partnership with SEVA, which is one of our big women's cooperatives, because they, know how, what to do or women and livelihood. But everybody had kids at home and you know, like all of you and all of us, we were struggling with what to do with our own kids. So I think there is a lot of partnerships out there, especially with organized forces. I mean, we've not broken into teachers unions, but I think that's another organized force which could be you know, turned around in some other way to, to you know, come into this. So Somia, a lot to be done. And I think looking outside of the typical boundaries of an education system are needed. Well, the number one rule of show business is always leave them wanting more. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, you never want to go off stage with people going like, oh, I wish it had ended 15 minutes before. Uh, there are people running to other meetings. So we, we, have, um, we have more questions than we can handle. Perhaps I couldn't summarize them and send them to you in an email. And we could have a little email exchange and I could forward them back to the students. Um, I am going to give Dr. Amrit Thapa the last question. Uh, he has sort of a big picture question about what the rest of the world may learn from India uh, in this post-COVID age or how challenging it may be to do, and do, do some of these uh, things. Dr. Thapa. Thank you, Alec. Um, thank you, Dr. Benerjee, for such an is that Central Park behind you? Yes, yes. Today is a sunny day and I wanted to feel that um, here. So uh, we had had, uh, you know, cold weather for, um, for a long time. So uh, coming back to the question, uh, actually just a quick uh, background about me. I'm from Nepal, um, but I did spend five years of my education in India. So um, I, I very much uh, take interest in, uh, in the topics that you presented. And what I really found interesting was the last piece um, when you were wrapping up your talk about uh, post-COVID strategy that you mentioned that doing a quick SR-like survey and then helping students uh, with um, on catching up on the learning. Um, I was really uh, intrigued by that. And I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about that. Particularly, I'm trying to see if you know, that can be related to other countries, developing countries like Nepal, Bangladesh, or even other African or Latin American countries, 
So um, these countries are already behind on a lot of things like resources and Ade earlier pointed out, you know, the readiness part and, and, and infrastructure. So how do we, how can we say that this will, how can we make it work or how can we say that this can happen this time when we are already so much behind? What are some of the practical strategies that we could um, use um, to make that happen? So thank you. Yeah, so I think very quickly, two different challenges. And one I call leap forward, which is the younger ones. How do you just you know, do things right so you're not bogged down by the over ambitious curriculum in first grade and hold your mom's hand and just jump, right? And jump in a way that was developmentally appropriate, but is easy to do. I mean, easy to do in the sense it's not, it doesn't need lots of resources. It just needs accepting that a breadth of skills in the early age cognitive skills, physical skills, lots of talk, lots of everyday math that everybody can be involved in is important and don't get bogged down by my first grade textbook and what it tells me to do sequel. But there too, you have to put aside the conventional teddy bear, which is the textbook, which is the, you know, the school year and so on. And then there is a catch up. So these are two different kinds of movements, one which is trying to jump ahead of the problem and the other one is trying to come back from behind. And I think that, see, I, as far as South Asia is concerned, I think we have an advantage because a lot of our school systems are in the language of at least of the region, even if it's not the exact language I speak at home, it's not a colonial language. So, you know, my mom may not be very literate, but she can understand what is going on and if I, she can tell me a story, I can write, you know, blah, blah, blah. Whereas there are African countries, particularly the Francophone countries, where there is some other language complexity, which makes it a little bit more difficult for just the community, the grandparents, the parents to maybe get involved. So in the context that the language is quite common and that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, I, I think there the shift is that you're gonna move, as I described from on my table, you're gonna move at least for part of the day, every day from rows to columns. That's you're giving up your comfort zone in a big way. And the way we try to do it within our own school systems is to say before everybody takes a jump, let's have some people take the jump. And those some people, let's say I call them leaders of practice, but they are the level above the teacher, not very high up, because I need people who can hold the teacher's hand so in India, you know, it's a bit of a variation across states, but we have like one person who's in charge of say 20 schools or 25 schools. So if that person tries teaching at the right level for, and we've done this in many places, you do it for three weeks. Why three weeks? Because when a Pratham person does it, we know that every week the child can make a jump. So we want it long enough to be practiced so that you experience at least two jumps. Then you're a believer. Because you've done it yourself, it's not a pratham method. It's your, it's Amrit's method, and Amrit is now going to be the Messiah who's going to change everything, and he's going to tweak it a little bit in his own way. You know, we read stories. Amrit is going to write his own stories, or he'll choose the stories he likes and dump all the pratham stories. It doesn't matter. So I think that this, there is a way in which to make this go. You have to have some missionaries, because this is a jump of faith. It's not pedagogy. And of course, it's pedagogy, but you know, you're, if you're going to go against the grain, you have to have some missionaries who believe in it and believe it's their religion, not somebody else's religion. So we would be love to try something in Nepal because there's plenty of India not far from Nepal with a lot of missionaries there already. And one of the ways it works is to infect, <laughs> right? Not training, it's infection sessions. To say, try it out. And very often I will say to governments, I don't want a memorandum of understanding for three years. Give me one month. In one month, if we don't create believers, then six months is not going to do it. And you have to be seduced by the change you see in the kids. And the kids who are eight and above can make this acceleration. The younger kids can't. They take time. So it's all, a, I mean, I think I'm more and more, I think I have to go back to business school and do some marketing or some other degree because that's what is needed here. Thank but you so I'm much. Happy to talk. I'm happy to talk uh, further. Uh, later, if you thank you uh, so much, I, I really hope your ideas will be infectious all over. Great points, thank you. Well, and I think I speak for all of us in saying that it's been a really wonderful 
hour and a half that you've spent with us. I know it must be, I know you have things to attend to there. Um, and I hope everyone can give you a Zoom hand, you know. <laughs> I would say if someone, no, it's wants, really good. If someone wants to make money, they should invent a little Zoom app where everyone could clap and you could hear everyone clapping as if you were in the room. It can't be that hard, right? It can't <laughs> be that hard. Anyway, uh, thank you very, very much for joining us. I'll follow up with you a little bit with some of the questions that uh, came up that uh, we were not able to get to. And, um, and I love talking to all of you. And uh, I mean, now the weekend begins for me. So thank you. Awesome. And I'll be in touch next week about politics. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Thank, Bye, you. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.